Hello, and welcome to the RI Science Podcast. In this episode, we hear from Yang Hui He and Madeleine Hall from the London Institute of Mathematical Sciences, which is based here at the RI. Yang is a fellow of the London Institute. Madeleine is a science writer at the London Institute. Together, we'll be exploring the history of geometry and how it's still relevant to us today. This conversation was inspired by Yang's recent talk at the Royal Institution. However, don't worry if you weren't there to hear it. No prior knowledge is necessary for this episode. If you'd like to get tickets for upcoming talks and live streams, head to our website, rigb.org. Welcome, Yang. Welcome, Madeleine. We are here to talk about geometry, but in case you don't remember your childhood maths lessons, what exactly is geometry, Yang? Well, a geometry in its simplest definition is just, you know, the study of shapes and sizes. And that's it, really. So geometry really came from, you know, like every ancient civilization would have a problem that's geometrical. Like, you know, what is the size of your granary that holds like wheat or, you know, or the size of a field? And that really was the beginnings of, you know, mankind's you know, mathematical quantitative understanding of what um, geometry is. I mean, even the word geometry comes from the Greek geometria, the measurement of Earth, the Earth measurement. So, but what what what's really interesting about mathematics is that geometry kickstarted what the Greeks called the formalization of mathematics, and this is what I'm referring to is Euclid's Elements, which is the first set of textbooks for mathematics. It's uh, 13 volumes in total. And it is, uh, I think, I believe, it is next to the Bible, the most widely printed book in human history. So it's so, geometry is a very good sort of entrance to formal mathematics because it's so visual. You know, it has very, very simple things, you know, things you can touch, you know, on, on a piece of paper, a line or a shape. And yet, just playing around with these concepts and, and, and figures gives you a sort of a very good entrance to what mathematics really is. When did those texts get written then? When did the field start? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So Euclid lived around the third century BC and the elements, of course, was not just everything that's Euclid. What he did was to collect all of the Greek mathematics that predated these volumes. So things like the Pythagoreans, you know, Apollonius and all that stuff. So it was, it was a compendium of the entirety of the Greek knowledge of mathematics. Madeline, what do you uh, think about when you think of geometry? Um, I know you're also a practicing mathematician. What's it mean to you, the term geometry? I agree completely with Yang's description that geometry at its core is just the study of shapes and and sizes. Uh, I think the fun problems in geometry arise when we think about the interactions between different shapes. Um, and by shapes, we don't just mean, you know, your friendly neighborhood two-dimensional square or circle or triangle. A shape in the geometric context can be a single point, which is zero dimensional, or a, a line, a straight line, one dimensional, 3D shapes, 4D shapes, whatever dimension you like. When we talk about shapes in geometry, we can talk about objects in any dimension. Well, we'll I guess we'll come on to more than three or four dimensions later. But when you talk about uh, those early days of geometry and the kind of problems that people were solving, what was going on in society that needed mathematics or that, that these mathematicians discovered that helped societies to develop? So, for example, uh, in around 2500 BC, the ancient Egyptians built the pyramids of Giza, which is a fundamentally geometric endeavor because they need to know how much stone to use. And there is evidence of geometry problems recorded by scribes in ancient Egypt, which dates back to around 2000 BC. And so geometry as a field existed before Euclid, but it was Euclid formalizing the axioms of geometry around 300 BC, which really is the foundation of the intellectual pyramid of mathematics 
which we are continuing to build upon to this day. And every new layer that we build on is supported by the layers. And Euclid was like an academic or a mathematician or? It's very, it's very difficult to put these people in boxes, right? Like they, these people were philosophers and they were politicians and they made laws and they also ran societies and did mathematics. They were properly polymaths. Polymaths, <laughs> indeed. And these writings, they still exist today? You can go to a library and see them or they're just passed down in folklore? Or... Yeah, so one thing, one of the greatest tragedies of the ancient world was the burning down of the, of the Library of Alexandria around the first century AD, where you know, almost a million volumes of the ancient world, of the antiquity, of, including Euclid, uh, was, was just burned down. And, but of course, there are surviving fragments from various generations, from scribes, Christian scribes from Syria that took them to, to the Roman world. Um, so there, there is one, there is, I, think, to, I, I believe, one of the oldest surviving um, pieces, just a little fragment of Euclid's elements, is the Oxyrhynchus papyrus, which is now housed in the National Museum in Oxford. And I think that is first or second century BC. And you can go and see that? You can go see it. It's, you can actually, it's there. And I highly encourage everyone to go see that. And in terms of what Madeline was saying there about this was the foundation, what, what, what does that mean, this is the foundation of mathematics? I mean, you're saying this is still true today, the things that were found out 2,000 years ago. This is an extremely good point that Maddie just raised. And I was just going to, I want, that's ex exactly the example I wanted to use. Uh, Maddie's example of the pyramids. So, you know, this is much, much more ancient, you know, thousands of years before Euclid. And, you know, the pyramids, for example, could not have been built without Pythagoras' theorem. Now, the, the fact that, you know, if you take a right angle triangle, the sum of the square, the sum of the squares of the two right sides is the sum of the hypotenuse. The Egyptians knew about this. You know, the ancient cultures, like the Chinese had versions of this. Uh, the Chinese had a three, four, five right angle triangle in, in texts uh, predating uh, Euclid. Um, and you, you can't, in fact, you can't build anything with, without that knowledge. But that's not mathematics. That's an engineering fact. It's a law. It, it seems like if you do a measurement uh, to any right angle triangle, we all know what a right angle triangle is. It's just a right, an angle that, you know, a triangle there, where, where there's one side is 90 degrees. Um, but what's different about Euclid, and in, in particular what is different about Greek mathematics, which I guess what we modern mathematicians would call as the beginnings of true mathematics, is the process of derivation from a given set of axioms for these facts. So it's called Pythagoras' theorem, not Pythagoras' axiom of Pythagoras' law, because there's a fundamental difference between a definition and an axiom and a theorem, and that is mathematics. And that's why geometry is so good at demonstrating what mathematics is, right? So, so take Euclid. Um, all of Euclidean geometry has only five axioms, right? So axioms are things that you take for granted. So these are the starting point. I think in my discourse, I said mathematics is a chess game. You lay down the rules. The pawn can move here, the king can move here. The only small set of rules. If chess has 5,000 rules, then it's not a very interesting game, right? The whole point about chess is that, you know, there are a handful of rules, and then you play it. And there are millions and trillions and different variations of games. So mathematics is exactly that, or proper mathematics is exactly that. So the five axioms are very, very, very simple, and, and things that are self-evident. So... Um, and axioms are different from definitions. A definition is just something that you, you define, you know, like a pawn is a piece. And then the axiom is how the pawn can move. So in mathematics, you know, a point is, you know, a point and, you know, and so on. So the five axioms of Euclid are just these five. Axiom number one, between any two points, there exists a straight line. Well, that's very obvious, right? Axiom number two, any line interval can be stretched infinitely in both directions. Okay, that's also obvious. Anything that's not obvious is not an axiom, right? So axiom number three, given any point and any length, you can construct a circle whose center is that point and the radius is that length. Okay, that seems pretty obvious. Axiom number four, all right angles or 90 degree angles are equal. 
And then the last axiom is the axiom number five, which is given any line and a point not on this line, there exists a unique parallel line that never meets that line. That's it. So these are the rules of the game. And in Euclidean, the point of Euclidean geometry is that every single imaginable result of that geometry must be derivable from these five facts. And there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of very, very useful facts, such as Pythagoras' theorem. So do they explain everything about the modern world then, these five facts? Well, not everything about the modern world. Um, for example, when humans discovered that the Earth is round, it's spherical, the fifth axiom in particular led to some inconsistencies in how we did geometry on the surface of the Earth. So, uh, for example, one of the mathematical truths that you can derive from the five axioms of Euclidean geometry is that the angles in a triangle sum to 180 degrees. But if you draw a triangle on the surface of the Earth, where one of the corners is at the North Pole, you can draw a triangle such that every single corner has an angle of 90 degrees. And so now you don't have angles summing to 180. This is a direct contradiction. So what's going on there? Yeah. And what was going on? So that's a very good point. So, um, so as long as you do geometry on a plane or, or flat space, then these axioms of Euclidean geometry will imply everything. And it will, it will be true for all time. And that is actually a very important thing about the difference between mathematics and science. Science is, you know, science is inductive. Mathematics is deductive in the sense that, you know, science has inductive theories, you experiment, you test. But mathematics is just universal truth. If you accept these five axioms, then every single fact about it would be true. And the, the example that Mahdi used, if you do geometry on a, on a sphere or, or the surface of a ball, then you don't have this fact that, you know, the, the sum of internal sum is at 180 degrees, precisely because you've dropped one of the axioms. So on a sphere, you've dropped the fifth axiom. And that, that is actually a really, really interesting story of its own that goes for thousands of years. If you only use the first four axioms, then you can't actually derive the fact that the internal sum of angle is 180 degrees. But you, again, you're working on a different framework. So with these four, you can't derive that fact. And that's something which I did emphasize in the discourse, which is like the importance of realizing what the rules of games are. And if you drop one of the rules, what new results you would lead to. So what happened next then? So what was the next big thing in geometry? Um, well, the Greeks knew that the Earth is not flat. The Greeks knew the, the, the Earth is a round sphere, uh, or more or less. And so these guys were thinking about not only can you not derive the fifth axiom from the, from the other four, if you relaxed it, you would be able to treat this new geometry, the geometry on the surfaces of, of spheres. And that became known as non-Euclidean geometry. And it, grew, it gradually grew into this field of differential geometry and, and algebraic geometry, which are much more modern things. And it was Einstein's genius to realize, but this is not just pure math, right? This had nothing to do with physical observation, um, other than the fact that, okay, fine, you're playing with geometry on, on the surface of a ball. And it was Einstein's genius to realize that all of this conceptual stuff of Riemann was actually the reason why space and time created uh, gravity. So this became the theory of general relativity and, and the theory of special relativity. So it came full circle, you know, that you know, geometry came from physical roots, went into this abstraction, and then went back to the physical world. For someone who doesn't really understand maths, um, can't think of anyone in particular, um, what exactly, how do maths and science, um, geometry in particular, how do they interrelate? They're, they're constantly interrelated. Well, let me give a, a good definition of what mathematics is. This is a good definition. And this is a definition due to Galileo. 
Galileo says, mathematics is the language with which God created the universe. Now, let's try to parse what he meant by that. He just simply meant that if you're to have an understanding of the physical world around you, like everything that we see, from math to biology to chemistry to whatever, if you have a quantitative understanding of your surrounding environment as humans, then the only language to use to describe it is mathematics. And, and that's, I think that's without dispute. And I think, in the, so Galileo, of course, was before Newton. So Galileo said this famous saying, and Newton, in, in a way, answered this by giving that book, the Principia Mathematica, which was published in 1687. That book was Newton's answer, uh, at least in his conception of what we call the classical mechanics or this mechanistic Newtonian world of where, you know, that's a book where he laid down Newton's laws uh, the, you know, the famous ones that we memorize in school, and then using a, f a field of mathematics which he developed, which is called calculus, which is sort of a, a marriage between um, geometry, algebra, and an analysis. And all of that together, you can derive everything from the motions of the planets to, you know, the tides and waves and of, 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 of oceans. And, and that, that's the point about science and mathematics. I think it's also important to stress that geometry exists independent of humans. There are examples of geometry in nature that people have nothing to do with. You can think of hexagons in beehives or uh, the way that flowers arrange their petals around the seed head and actually the way that the seeds on the head of a flower are arranged themselves too. Um, yes, it's important Geometry is important when it comes to building bridges and constructing machines and dividing up land equally in um, ancient Greece. But geometry exists completely independent of humans as well. What does that mean, though? Is, that, is, it, is it, in that sense, a, a way of describing how nature has arranged things, or is it um, actually ex explaining why they look the way they do? I mean, or is it a bit of both? I think it's both. Um, I think people and mathematicians have developed the field of geometry, firstly, because it's fun. Like the, qu the open questions and the problems in geometry are profoundly satisfying to solve um, because it's such a, a visual discipline the thinking about the way shapes interact with one another uh, and solving problems relating to that is a very fun thing <laughs> for mathematicians to do. But also when we solve these problems and use those as a lens with which we can look through to examine how things are arranged in nature, that gives us an insight into why exactly petals are arranged around the head of a flower in a certain way. It's because the flower wants to expose as much of its petals as possible to sunlight? Or why do bees construct beehives in a hexagonal fashion? Is it, it's a structural endeavor. So I think it's both. I think it's, it's fun, but also gives us so much insight into the, the world around us. So how many different <clears throat> types of geometry are there? There sounds like there are tens of different types of geometry then. Yeah, so I mean, the field, the field of geometry has gone vast. It's, uh, you know, in the, in the original 13 books of Euclid, I think something like nine of them were on what we now call Euclidean geometry, where these five axioms derived all these fun facts. But then there have been all various generalizations. You know, there's um, the analytic geometry of Descartes, what we call Cartesian geometry, where you assign coordinates to points, and then you can start doing algebra with it. And then there is, uh, you know, projective geometry by adding points at infinity. And there is now algebraic geometry, which came a bit later, which is to purely manipulate um, geometric objects using the rules of algebra. Uh, not just analysis, but just purely algebra. So, yeah, it goes on and on and on. I mean, just, you, you know, this is what mathematicians do. And it's just like, um, and to, I love this word that Maddie's chosen because it's fun. It, it doesn't have to, to have anything to do with the real world. It's just very beautiful facts. So you can just play around and just see what, where you can go with these rules. But the remarkable thing is that every time you discover a new theory of mathematics, chances are it'll show up somewhere in the physical world. We have no idea why. In mathematics, there are no coincidences. Yeah. 
So, yeah, where does your research come in? What's the latest thinking around geometry in your own research? So I, I'm a mathematical physicist. And so I, I do um, my primary research is in quantum field theory and string theory, uh, which seem like very, you know, detached things. But uh, this is a community that uh, tries to understand the fundamental laws of the universe. Like, you know, what is the nature of space time? What is a black hole? You know, what is uh, what is a particle? And what I work on is to be a translator between pure geometers and these theoretical physicists, and what theorems of mathematics can we apply to try to understand and make sense of this, this quest for a unified fundamental theory of everything, which, you know, with this, this famous movie of uh, involving Hawking, the theory of everything. Uh, so I, I do these things called Clabial manifolds, which is a way of reducing string theory from high dimension to our four dimensional world. Um, my colleague here in the London Institute, um, Alexander Oshirov, he works on the geometry of scattering amplitudes. So, you know, these are particles that accelerate, you know, accelerators like in CERN, they, 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 you know, they smash into and create new particles. And now there's a new program to completely make that computation geometrical. And it's called scattering amplitude computation using positive geometry. So it's, it's amazing how it just shows up in these very fundamental things. So for those of us who are not so familiar with that, what, what is string theory and how does it relate to geometry? So string theory is this idea that the fundamental building blocks of the universe are these string-like structures, um, which can either be open or closed. So an open string or a closed loop. And these uh, building blocks can assume different modes and vibrations. And it's those different modes which give rise to the fundamental particles that we all know and love, like electrons and the Higgs boson. And string theory predicts that the universe has a certain number of dimensions. And depending on your flavor of string theory, for example, you might be working with a universe that has 10 dimensions. And humans, we, we know that four dimensions exist because we have the three dimensions that we occupy in space plus time. So we, we can see four dimensions. Um, and so a natural question to ask is, where are the other six? Where are the other six dimensions? And what string theorists and mathematical physicists like Yang do is they suppose those six dimensions that we can't see as humans, but that string theory predicts exists, are hidden on surfaces and hidden in geometries that we just can't perceive. And those geometries are termed Calabi Yau manifolds. So these are surfaces which have folded up and contorted themselves in some way that human beings just simply can't see them. But that doesn't mean that they're not there. And that is how mathematical physicists are navigating this new paradigm of string theory and, you know, in an endeavor to uncover the secrets of the universe. Well, thank you very much for that very lovely prece of the field of string theory. But I'd just like to add to that. So string theory is uh, still currently the best theoretical unification of the two pillars of modern physics. So the two pillars of modern physics is, uh, the two pillars are um, general relativity, which explains the world of galaxies and stars to extreme precision. And then the other is quantum field theory, which describes the world of the small, like um, electrons and quarks to extreme precision. This has been tested to unbelievable um, precision, like the discovery of the Higgs and the recent uh, measurement of the um, uh, gravitational waves. So they all got Nobel prizes. So, um, you know, whether you know whether you're a string theorist or not, um, let's just go. Let's turn the clock back to Einstein uh, and back to the early quantum mechanics, uh, like you know Schrödinger and and, and these people. Um, uh, so, so string theory is a sort of brainchild of that tradition. But, but what this tradition is, since the turn of the 20th century of what we call modern physics, so there is no experimental evidence for, for string theory, so people may or may not accept it as a theory of science. But 
What is true about general relativity and quantum mechanics is that they're absolutely tested to unbelievable precision. But you know, we think about what the fundamental science of today is. We think about you know, general relativity and, and quantum field theory. Those theories have been, over the last 100 years, been following what's called the geometrization program. So that's just really interesting, is that everything that we talk about in these fundamental theories of physics, since Einstein and Schrodinger you know, in the turn of the 20th century, we, um, the, the entire modern physics community have an understanding that what these guys are all working on, this is a combination of physicists and mathematicians, is just various aspects of geometry. So uh, space-time is curvature, the study of Riemannian manifolds and curvature and differential geometry. And you know, if you talk about things like what is light, what is a photon, what is an electron, these things, to a geometer, they're called you know, representation theories of, of Lorentz groups and representation theory of Lie groups, which are all geometric objects. So that's really kind of very, very interesting. So, and you know, string theory is like this new brainchild of this tradition, but for, for 100 years, it is now you know, undisputable that modern physics is founded on the, you know, the grounds of this geometrization program. So that's why it's, you know, you know, forget about your buildings and, and pyramids. Our very structure of our understanding of what reality is, is a geometrical understanding. So if uh, geometry is so omnipresent in our lives and what have you, why don't we talk about it or use that word in everyday discourse? It, it's like that thing with the set square and, the, and, and, you know, and your ruler and you, something you learned at school and then you've forgotten. So why do you think people don't talk about it? I think it might be because it is so self-evident. These axioms, we do take them for granted. It is so obvious that... Uh, given two points, you can draw a straight line between them and all of these other axioms of geometry. Because we take these things for granted, they're, they're not up for discussion. They're not up for debate. You can't, yeah, yeah we can sit here and, and debate, you know, questions in, in biology or, or like chemistry or, or whether or not the fundamental building blocks of the universe are particles or strings. But these Axioms of geometry are not up for discussion. <laughs> That's actually a really good one. I never thought about uh, Maddie's point that you know it's self-evident. But there is also, I find this in the very opposite direction. I find somehow humanity has reached the stage where there's an inherent fear of mathematics. Mm. We didn't used to be like this. Up to the 19th century, Euclid's elements was taught to every school child is now taken out of the math curriculum in this country. And I think probably in most countries, I think maybe in Russia and China you still do uh, geometry. And I think mathematics, maybe mathematics, the, the way mathematics is taught in schools is that here's a fact, memorize it, here's another fact, memorize it. And if that's the way you do approach mathematics, it's impossible because you end up memorizing tens of thousands of facts. Uh, there are, you know, as I said in geometry, there's, there are only five facts you should remember. Everything else should be derived. The, the way the mathematics is taught today is that you don't teach it like this is the game. And then you don't have to memorize anything. It just becomes this like little, and then it becomes much more fun. And because math, math is not fun anymore at the school level, there's this societal fear of mathematics. Oh my God, there's like this, this random thing that you have to memorize 10,000 facts for, and it's just impossible. So I think maybe there is that you don't want to talk about, you know, oh my goodness, geometry is something I don't want to get into because it does not involve like all these facts I have to memorize, which is exactly how math should not be done. So for you, Yang, um, how does your knowledge of geometry affect the things that you notice in nature and the world around us? Well, I, I like this. I, I like Maddie's choice of word fun. <laughs> um, you know, let me go back to Pythagoras again. So like um, before I get what I see, but you know, like in Pythagoras, after you've proven Pythagoras, it's now it's a theorem, it's a fact from these axioms. It's profoundly useful because now you can build buildings, you can actually build pyramids. But that's not why mathematicians like Pythagoras' theorem. Pythagoras' theorem, we like Pythagoras' theorem because it's, it's a remarkably fun fact. 
Like given these five rules, you can suddenly get a, a, a concept of a triangle and a right angle triangle has this property that that is very, very profoundly interesting. And that's why we do it. Um, but in terms of, you know, walking down the street, what do I see in terms of geometry? I think there, there is something that I, that I like, that, which is what I work on, which is the field of algebraic geometry and, or, or projective geometry. Um, again, this is a, a mild generalization of Euclidean geometry. Every time I walk down the streets of London and I see um, in the distance, you know, if you have a very long street and you see how the buildings go meet at infinity. And this is perspective. And of course, this, this is actually remarkably, this idea of projective geometry came remarkably later, and it's after, it's after the Renaissance. Uh, because if you look at medieval paintings, everything's very flat. But then suddenly in the, in the Renaissance, it clicked. Oh, maybe we should add this point at infinity. And if you, you could actually see this in all of the portraits post-Renaissance. And, and you can see this in, I don't know, I'm sure Turner had paintings of streets of London, uh, where you could see your streets get, you know, narrow, narrow as they go farther away. And even in your, your human perception, it's a fact what we call projective geometry. And that what that projection means is to add that point at infinity where everything converges in the distance. And every time I walk on, a, on the streets of London, especially like Piccadilly, which is a very long street, um, you see, wow, this is projective geometry at work here. And it's... It's nice. That's non-Euclidean, but it's a very nice fact. So what three things would you like people to remember about geometry then? If you, what's your, what's your takeaway? Um, one, um, appreciate Euclid. I mean, don't read the original, it's impossible, to read, but you know. Two, remember that mathematics is about derivation and it's a game. It's not about memorizing facts. And three is that it's a fun endeavor that is everywhere. You know, I just think, you know, like one should uh, appreciate uh, the derivation of Pythagoras' theorem as one would appreciate a sonnet of Shakespeare. And it, it, there's something inherently beautiful about that. And then I hope that would take away the fear of the public of mathematics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would say one thing is that people are still doing geometry. It's still an ongoing activity which people are thinking about every single day, not just in mathematics, but across disciplines. Uh, and three examples which I touched on, well, some examples that I've touched on are, firstly, geometry is fundamental in engineering and architecture and disciplines like that. Uh, geometry is also fundamental in mathematical physics and in trying to uncover secrets of string theory and of the universe. Um, but then also just in its own right, geometry is an active area of research and there are so many open problems concerning shapes in across numbers of dimensions and how they interact with one another. And actually Marina Vyazovska who won the Fields Medal in 2022. The Fields Medal is the, quote, Nobel Prize of mathematics. Uh, she is a mathematician who does number theory and geometry, and she won the Fields Medal for cracking a sphere packing problem in eight dimensions. So uh, that's something that I would love people to appreciate, is that people are still do doing geometry every single day. Actually, we just uh, interviewed Marina here at the London Institute. Oh, well, it was on Zoom, but it's picking up. It's getting tens of thousands of hits because we had the, the world expert on geometry and number theory explain to us what these problems are and why she's interested in geometry. So I highly recommend you to listen to that on YouTube. And if, if, if you're interested to know more about geometry, what would be your, what would be your top tips? Buy Yang's books. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, my books, are, no, don't my, that would be useless. Oh, you want, buy my books, for sure. But that's not gonna be, I don't know, that's a really good question. Oh, how would you get into that? There are so many uh, introductory geometry puzzles that you can nerd snipe people with, uh, you know, at the pub or, or at dinner or uh, in the coffee shop. There are so many fun questions about, for example, one that I posed to 
the members of the London Institute recently is how to arrange four points in a two-dimensional plane such that only two distinct distances are required. Uh, and so it's called the four points, two distances problem. And that, among many, many others, is one accessible geometry puzzle in, in mathematics, which anyone can get their hands dirty with. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Madeline. Thank you very much, Yang. Um, that's all we have time for for this episode. Thanks very much for listening. Please leave us a rating and let us know what you think and to help more people find the podcast. If you're ready for more science, head over to rigb.org to book tickets for all our upcoming talks and live streams from more amazing speakers.